based on what we know about the complexities of their brains, about the complexities of their social structure, means that um, their basic needs are really not that different from our own basic needs. And I think it's fair, I feel, as a scientist, I don't feel that I'm being anthropomorphic at all when I say that it's worth thinking about putting ourselves in Lucy's shoes, so to speak. Just imagining what it is like for her as a social individual, highly social animal, to be there on her own, to be in this very small, confining space. Imagine how it would be for you. I don't think that that is going too far. I think that we can do that and feel sure that we are, we're probably correct in feeling that it doesn't feel very good for her. That she's lonely, that she's bored, that she's frustrated. And the stereotypic behavior that you see in captivity is, is a result of that. It sometimes starts when young animals are chained, they're trying to take a step, they cannot, and this develops into this, this pattern of behavior. We do not see it in the wild. To say that it is anticipatory behavior, well, it may be that when an elephant is anticipating something, people arriving, it may get, you know, it, this may happen. But that's not the reason for it. That's not the ultimate reason for it. The ultimate reason is that they are bored and frustrated. And it's abnormal behavior. It's a sign that there's something is wrong. Um, yes, yeah, so as, as Ed was saying, that um, the keepers are providing Lucy, or it wasn't Ed, it was, it was talking about keepers providing Lucy with um, all that she had to say through Bob. Um, that, you know, the keepers for Lucy are her, are her only friends. But that doesn't mean that if she were provided, with the possibility to be with other elephants, that that wouldn't be better. That would be better for Lucy. And I, I feel from, I spent uh, uh, about four or five hours yesterday with Lucy, watching her, um, watching her interacting with her keepers, uh, watching her just go through the course of the day. And I think that it's fair to say that what I observed yesterday was highly unusual, uh, in that they knew that I was there, uh, the media was there, so Lucy got a lot of attention yesterday. But what I saw in Lucy uh, early on in the day was um, uh, a listless elephant. Um, she was not she was not in the terrible shape that <coughs> Maggie was in, <coughs> but she was very listless. Uh, she does have some difficulties walking. She sort of shuffles along. Uh, the, the main problems that I saw with Lucy just in terms of physical was that she is, um, well, she's, she's actually uh, 4,000 pounds over what she would be if she was living in the wild. And part of that has to do with that animals living in captivity tend to be bigger because they've been fed more nutritious, sometimes more nutritious food. But a lot of it is that she is just plain obese. And that impacts uh, all of her uh, other health conditions. Uh, the other thing is Lucy does have this uh, respiratory issue that is um, not clear what it is. I, I did observe <coughs> the, um, I forgot one of the better words, snot, <laughs> that was, uh, uh, that Lucy sort of dripped out of her trunk every 30 or 40 meters. But it, it does look very clear to me. I'm not a vet. It's not my place to, to really talk about, um, about that and more about her behavior. But she walked, she went on a long walk, she came back, she was with the media, she seems a very placid elephant, um, a, a kind, a nice elephant, if you, if you want to call it that. And um, in the afternoon, uh, because I was still there, I would guess, uh, the keepers played hide and seek with her. And she, that was the first time I saw her animated and behaving or showing characteristics of a, of a wild elephant. She, she obviously thought it was a, a great sport and she 
sort of sucked her cheeks in the way elephants do when they get very excited and her ears were out and uh, she actually got to the point of running across the enclosure. So, you know, as far as could Lucy move, uh, again, this is up to the vets to decide, but I saw an elephant that looked to me uh, perfectly capable of being, of being moved. Uh, and I think that based on what we know of her normal life here, of spending 75% of her time indoors, uh, living alone, living in a cold climate, um, I think that Lucy, what if we uh, care about Lucy, the best thing is to, to let her go and to allow her to go to Paul's or to go to maybe the, the other sanctuary, a place where she can explore her surroundings, be with other elephants. And I think I would be extremely surprised if in that kind of a situation, if Lucy doesn't just blossom, but she will thrive being in the company of other elephants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Later today, uh, Ed Stewart and I are going to meet with uh, Linda Cochran, who is the uh, director of a commission, a city commission, that uh, manages the zoo. And I have pled with her to allow Dr. Poole to be with us. Because, well, Ed, 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 you have just heard, Dr. Poole, if she could just plead the case with the city officials, because some, some of the council people are supposed to be in this meeting as well. And of course, whatever I say, they will then say, well, what does Bob Barker know about elephants? This lady knows about elephants. And this lady has summed it up for you. And she could sum it up for the council members and for this commissioner, this, uh, uh, for, uh, Linda Cochran, if she will allow her in the meeting. And here's a lady who's paid thousands of dollars to go and speak and to uh, instruct uh, staffs at, uh, at sanctuaries and zoos. She's here of her own volition, all the way from Kenya. And perhaps she will not be allowed to attend the meeting. I hope, since that announcement was made in today's <coughs> newspaper, that Linda Cochran will change her mind and allow Dr. Poole to speak. And I have another gentleman.